Awesome. All right, let's get started. Welcome everybody to our machine learning for protein engineering seminar series. Today, I'm happy to introduce Noelia Farouz. Noelia is originally a chemist. She's a PhD in computational biophysics. She did a short stay at Pfizer in Boston, hooray. And then she joined Professor Hawker's lab in Beirut, Germany as a postdoc. She worked in developing computational methods for protein design. She's currently a senior researcher at the University of Girona in Spain, and she's fascinated by AI methods and she wants to find in the protein science. And with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Noelia. Thank you. And thank you very much for having me here and for the kind introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. Now, I hope you can see my screen. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, thank you, Kevin, for the very kind introduction. And as you said, now I'm a senior researcher at the University of Girona. Today, I am going to present some of the work I did during my postdoc at uh, uh, Professor Hoka's group in Bayreuth. And I will present my work entitled A Deep Unsupervised Model for Protein Design. right now. Um, so as we know, protein design is incredibly challenging. For example, the goal, the end goal that we want is to end up with a protein that performs a function that we are interested here in, in performing. Like for example, here I'm showing the reaction of the famous deals cell the reaction. And we may want to imagine a protein that takes these two substrates and perform and end up with, with this product. But this is very challenging. Usually, so I like to divide the current approaches that we have in protein design in, uh, in three uh, based on how we treat the scaffold. Um, one of the first approaches ordered by complexity will be by taking a protein from one of the structural databases that we have, like the PTV or, or from the sequence databases like the Uniprot, and then perform optimization like a uh, direct devolution to optimize the function. <clears throat> Another approach will be to, for example, take uh, PDBs and then split them into different pieces and treat them as if, after, as if they were puzzle pieces and combine them in different ways to form protein chimeras. This way we can take two functions, functions and combine them to, uh, to create a protein with these two functions or a new one. And the most complex of the approaches is the novel design in which we try to literally draw a sequence and then hope that it falls in the structure that we wish and that it performs the function that we want. This is terribly challenging. And although there are a lot of success in the last years, it's still a, an unsolved problem. So most of my postdoc, I've been working on the second approach. So at uh, Professor Hoka lab, we were working on finding pieces of uh, proteins that are homologous and then combining them to form new chimeras. In particular, I developed the fossil database, which is a database of um, homologous fragments. So fragments that are reused through the protein space and that then we can use because they have interesting properties and combine them to new ones. And then I develop ProtLego, which is uh, a Python package that then, then takes these pieces and combines them in the most optimal ways to form uh, new protein chimeras that have specific functions. But today I'm going to focus on some of the work that I've been doing lately over the last months on de novo, or we could say novel or artificial design using um, neural, neural networks. Traditionally, protein design has been uh, approached uh, mathematically as an optimization problem in which we have a multidimensional function with many, many dimensions, which is uh, defined by an energy function. This energy function can be a, can go from very simple, like uh, one of the most simple energy functions that we have is the global minimum energy conformation model. And then we can keep adding layers of complexity up to uh, quantum mechanics. So for example, adding back on flexibility or including several conformations into the protein to design all of them all together. 
The way that we search the global minima of this energy function depends on the algorithm that we choose. And because this is computationally very expensive, most often we were using non-deterministic algorithm, algorithms, um, so heuristic ones like uh, Monte Carlo approaches. I collected in these tables most of the software or algorithm that have been developed over the last, let's say, 20 years. In blue, I mentioned every addition that has been done from the Rosetta software or community, and in red, uh, all the additions from the Osprey community. And some of the algorithms are actually, or they seem to be working very well, but they were, sometimes it happens that they are never released. In any case, um, this was, so to say, the traditional approach. So uh, this energy function was described uh, by physical um, chemical terms. So we take the 3D structure and then for every atom, we compute pairwise interactions and so on. But we are seeing in the last years like a shift in perspective. So here I am just showing like three examples that I collected from the last four months. We have this, and I'm collecting these three because I particularly like them, but there are many, many other uh, also works uh, being published lately, which don't necessarily use or entirely use uh, physical chemical energy functions but they are being, they are using neural models. So like the hallucination paper or uh, this other very nice work. So I think that we are observing at the moment like a, a shift in the paradigm, paradigm of how to design new proteins. And I think this is very interesting. And then we are gonna have like a, um, a new perspective in protein design. So today I would like to focus on one of the methods that could um, start uh, showing great potential for protein design, which is sequ sequence generation. And in particular, we have been thinking, so us and others about how protein sequences are very similar to natural languages. So one of the most obvious similarities is that they are ordered hierarchically. For example, uh, we have in, in natural language, we have alphabets, but also we, in proteins, we think we have all the letters, which are the amino acids. And the alphabets form words the same way that amino acids form a structural elements, secondary structural elements. And then these ones assemble to form proteins that carry a function, the same way that words form sentences that have a meaning. And then at the higher level, then we have proteins that combine to form a large quaternary structure that sometimes contains several domains. The same way that several sentences can form a paragraph or a text. And these similarities are not only obvious at the hierarchical level, but also there are several instance instances in which we see uh, analogies. For example, uh, we all know that a single typo can change complete, completely the meaning of a, of a sentence. Like in here, your manuscript is now publishable or not publishable. And the same happens with a single mutation that can promote misfolding. Also, in this doesn't always entirely work, but um, sometimes when we change the order of letters in a sentence, uh, or we don't entirely change the meaning. So it's the same. And the same can happen with a circular permutation. So the structure remains the same and also the function. And uh, lastly, we also have, uh, or this is a very famous sentence in the NLP community, sentences that are grammatically correct, but that they don't really make any sense, like colorless green ideas sleep furiously which yeah, doesn't mean anything really. Uh, and we also have instances that are kind of weird in proteins so that they fold and have a structure, but they misfold or like amyloid fibers that we don't really understand very well. But anyway, um, I think this sounds very optimistic, like they are so similar that we can entirely use any NLP method to protein research and it will just work. But uh, there are, of course, also some differences. So um, although in languages, we also have some constraints, like we cannot put any sound after another because some, like we, we have some constraints in the way we speak. Uh, we also have some constraints in the sense that sequences have to fold in 3D structures. And sometimes we are going to have three-dimensional clashes. 
So not every amino acid after another is going to work. Um, so this doesn't, uh, although we have that in, in natural languages, is more pronounced in proteins, I believe. And also uh, the concept of multiple sequence alignment. So for example, we've seen great success in the alpha fold uh, model and the MSA transformer, for example. And this uh, comes because they started using a simple multiple sequence alignment, which is a concept that doesn't really work very well for languages because we have, yeah, we have synonyms, but we don't really have like um, alignment of synonyms. They don't really work well in the sense that they don't share any identity of the letters. So yeah, there are, um, there are many similarities, but also we have some differences. In any case, uh, given that there's still so many similarities, uh, we, I believe we can still harness a lot of the progress that we are seeing in NLP research for protein problems, so for protein research. And uh, this is not something that only I believe, but this is something that we've been observing in, in protein research now for decades. So in here, I show, um, uh, progress or like tendencies that were working in NLP research and in here how it has been mirrored to protein sequences. For example, um, in the early 2000s, we used to have, uh, or NLP was dominated by uh, shallow methods like hidden Markov models or SVM. And they also years later were largely used in protein research, like for sequence classification or homology detection. And still for homology detection, it is the state of the art method like in HA search. And then years later during the deep learning revolution, uh, the computer vision people started using convolutional networks, which then was adapted as well to NLP. And then soon we started seeing as well, many convolutional networks starting uh, using sequences, for example, for DNA, DNA banding prediction. Then um, the NLP community shifted towards recurrent networks because they work much better at uh, modeling um, sequential data. And this soon was adapted for uh, uh, protein research. Like for example, we recently saw the Uniref model, which is an LSTM. They were two vec um, model was directly applied to proteins as well, like in ProtVec or the proteins embedding, embeddings from Kevin. And uh, also the attention mechanism inspired several of the breakthroughs we've seen in protein research, in protein research like AlphaFold. But I believe that the most prominent of all these uh, advances in LP, in NLP that has been mirrored to protein sequences is the transformer. So ever since the implementation of the first transformer, We've seen several um, NLP transformers. I will I will go into detail later, but they have been also been applied to to proteins. So some of the examples are ASM, tape, protrans, progene, and progpt2, which is the one that I'm gonna uh, present today in detail. And I believe that with all the advances that we are seeing in transformers, and in particular in conditional transformers, then in a few years, or maybe already this year, we'll see uh, advances in tailored protein design, which is finally the, the major goal that we want. So uh, what are really transformers? I will try not to get very technical, but, and also because I believe that most of the audience already uh, know a bit what transformers are. But originally, the major advance or what dominated uh, the implementation of transformers was the, the attention mechanism. So um, traditionally, sec to sec models, like in here, uh, where uh, architect, they had an architecture formed by an encoder and a decoder module. The encoder uh, took an input, which then was transformed to a context vector, which was then passed to a decoder, which was in charge of producing a, uh, an output. And then this, con this has issues I'm not going to get into, but this context vector was usually uh, formed by uh, the last step of the encoder. So let's say that it was losing information on the way. So for a very long sentence, this wouldn't work very well because the beginning of the sentence will get lost. And the attention mechanism fixed that because it led the decoder to focus on different parts of the encoder at the same time, which is kind of how 
attention work, so like paying attention of the most relevant parts of the input. Um, and then the um, original transformer uh, went a step forward because it not only applied um, the attention from the decoder to the encoder, but also throughout the whole architecture, like in here. Um, I'm gonna try to summarize a little bit how the first transformer was, which is in the paper, I think we all know this paper, attention is all you need. Uh, we take a, it also had two, two modules, sorry. So it also had the encoder and the decoder. And then for the encoder, we had uh, six sub modules and also for the decoder. And each, each of these sub modules had uh, two layers for the encoder and three for the decoder. And the first layer is the one where the attention happens. So uh, for an input sentence, then we will get a vector encoding um, each of the words, for example, and then it will add a position encoding. And then this final vector then gets um, converted into a key query and value vector by multiplication with certain matrices, which is what we train. When then the, the dot production or the dot, uh, the dot product attention happens by multiplying the key and query vector and producing a score, which is what multiplies the value vector. This value vector, this is for word for the first word, but we have one of, of them for, it, for each word. So finally, then we have like a, for every word, like a vector that can be summed up to a final vector that represents the contribution of each of the other words. So for every word, then we can more or less see the contribution that the other words in the same sentence are uh, giving to the original word. And then we end up with a vector. And this happens through many times. Uh, through the first layer and then again in the next module and so on and so on. And then we also have the attention from the decoder to the encoder. So this is more or less what's happening is very convoluted, but uh, yeah, it is worked tremendously well. It was very good. And I like to express it as my, like, it's very complex, but like, let's say it's just two modules and then we have input coming in this case is for machine translation and then output coming. Uh, and it was so successful that people started uh, investigating this, this architecture a lot. So for example, uh, here, uh, some of the, I'm gonna focus in here first because this happened first. Some of the uh, first innovations came from entirely shedding the decoder um, uh, module. And then we have the encoder, which is very good at taking the input and then producing a vector. This uh, type of auto encoding architectures or uh, denoising, uh, denoising auto encoding architectures are called bird-like. But also we had uh, a lot of research in the area of shedding the encoder and then getting only the decoder module. And these GPT-like architectures are very good at producing generating text. So these ones are very good at encoding text or any sequence as input or anything as input. And then um, producing a vector that can be coupled to other downstream tasks. And this type of architectures are very good at generating text. Okay, this is only a summary of like how really successful transformers have been. I had a look today at the Hagen phase repository, which is a repository of uh, publicly available transformers, and there were over 40,000 models. These are only those that are public and only those that are in this repository. But here, um, uh, like outlining a um, summary of the ones that I like it more or that I find mo most prominent because they conferred like advances from the ones that were previously released. And for you to see, well, this is only like, I don't want to go into detail, but like dimensions of the models, they've been getting larger and larger and larger. And for you to see how successful they are also being in the protein field, um, all the ones that I'm, um, uh, with, uh, that I'm putting with a shadow or here in bluish, uh, all of them have been already applied literally the architecture to protein sequences. And today I'm going to focus on GPT-2, which is the one that I applied to the protein space. Why GPT-2? So GPT-2, I think everybody knows GPT-2 by now, but um, I don't know how it happened. So two years ago or three already, uh, I read the news and there was this model from OpenAI. It had been trained on Reddit, I believe. And the authors um, 
didn't want to release the model at the time because it was so good that it could be used for, you know, it, it could be misused uh, for fake news or, you know. So uh, I don't know, at the beginning, uh, it was very controversial, but I read some, some of the examples that it produces and then I, I got it. So for example, I picked this one. Uh, the way it works is that um, a user or the researchers in this case, they were put in a prompt, so an input, and then the model continues from, from there. So it continues based on the context. And the example was a train carriage containing controlled nuclear materials was stolen in Cincinnati today. Its whereabouts are unknown. And then GPT-2 continued. Um, the incident occurred in the downtown train line, which runs from Covington and Ashland stations. So I mean, I find it remarkable because first of all, it's like grammatically correct, which is already pretty impressive. And it continued and continued and it keep being correct all the time. And it also didn't change topic or direction. Like it was, it had coherence all the way. And also I Googled, because I've never read to, to Cincinnati, but I Googled and Covington and Ashland happened to be in Cincinnati. So this also blew my mind because so it, this thing had learned connections from the whole in, input data set and it had learned, you know, to, to make a, a big a relationship between these three cities. So I thought, okay, so if this is working this well with human natural language, imagine what we could do with proteins. And so, I don't know, I, for me it was better than the image net moment. And this is how I decided that I was gonna train it on the protein space, which took a while because this type of models require enormous resources. So I'm gonna get into that. Um, the first thing is the data set. We need a large data set for these very large architectures to train, but uh, uh, we have luckily many of them and the data sets that we have are ideal for transformers because um, I believe that proteins are ideal candidates for self-supervision. In self-supervision, we don't usually, so for example, the way that natural, in natural language works is that we give it the raw data and we don't have an annotation. So uh, it's the same in proteins. We have thousands of sequences. For example, this is the UniPark database and it's been increasing exponentially. I collected the data over the last 20 years and the UniRef 50, it's been increasing linearly since 2013 or so. And then annotation, annotation will be that we have either structure. So this is a PTB, which we don't even see or that we know the function for sure. And, SwissProd, which is the manually created database of annotated sequences, has like half a million sequences, so it will be somewhere here. Um, so really, we have a lot of raw data, but we, for many of the sequences, we don't really know what it, they do. We just have the sequence. So it is. This is great for transformers because we can anyway take the sequence and learn from them, regardless of whether we know really what they they are doing. Although I, I would say that with AlphaFold or Protein Infer, now we have a lot more uh, of possibilities for annotation. So anyway, I took Unirev 50, uh, the, the version at the time, it had almost 50 million sequences. And then I replaced the FASTA headers with the uh, coding text for GPT-2. I removed the FASTA headers because they are in English and Latin and I don't wanna confuse the model. And uh, and then I am encoded or I tokenized the, um, the data. So or usually for English, we just split words or there are other algorithms, uh, but for sequences, protein sequences, it, it is not as straightforward because we don't know where to split. So for that reason, I, although some of the options are just splitting by amino acid, I, I wanted to, to give it a try to byte per encoding. This is a sub word tokenization process, which uh, splits by the most frequent tokens in the data set. So I took the SwissPro data set. Um, this is a type, oh, sorry. Uh, but it had like um, half million sequences at the time. And, and then I produced over 50,000 tokens plus the special token, the end of text. And then I look at how more or less what it's finding and the average token length has for amino acids. So it produces, so at, at the very start, step during generation, it produces more or less four, three, two amino acids at a time. 
yeah, and then I train this. How I did this? Uh, at the beginning, I had clearly underestimated the amount of GPUs that I will need to train this. I feel like I will be, I don't know, I don't know, 10. But then while I started training, I started training, I realized that it will take me, that I will need much more resources. So uh, somehow, well, I kind of gave up, but then I received an email over Christmas or a bit before this Christmas that the cluster where I had access to, so the university where I was, needed uh, people testing a new cluster. They had just bought um, 128, 800, hundreds and they needed people to test them so I volunteer and they gave me access to the whole cluster for over Christmas so yeah that was a miracle so I got uh, I prepared the whole thing the Uniref and then all, all the sequences and then the final model train in the 128 GPUs in four days so I produced GPT-2 after many trials and errors which had uh, over 700 million parameters and it has 30, uh, uh, 36 layers, which corresponds to GPT-2 large. So that it could also be, that it could also be larger, but that's, that's the computational time that I had. And it's also at the moment, one of the largest models that we have available for protein research. And then I had the model, it had, it had trained well, so I needed to start generating sequences. And there are several ways in which we can do that. So we can have a perfectly well-trained model, but then we may still produce sequences that don't look good. So this is very obvious in English, but I don't have any idea how to check that in for, for the protein language. So I, I had a look at this paper. It's very nice. It checks how for different settings in which the way we produce um, sequences or text, how well the text looks like. And um, I follow the same steps that they did. There are three major ways in which we can infer for, from probabilistic models, because probabilistic models or this language model is able to produce a word based on the probability given the previous words. And one of the most obvious ways will be a greedy, greedy search in which, so we have a sentence and then we always pick the most probable the most probable token or word after but after a while this becomes always very repetitive so it starts always producing the same sequence so uh like i select the gpt2 and then produce a random input my, my random title was 10 best things to do in this one and then it produced the same text over and over. This one is a great place to visit and it's a great place to stay. This one is and blah, blah, blah. So this is not a way, the way we want to produce sequences. Um, then Beam Search tries to alleviate that by uh, not only including where, one word at a time, but by considering several options always. So you end up picking after several steps the best possibility. But it anyway ends up producing repetitive text. So the best way is possibly random sampling in which, so it randomly picks the next word based on the distribution, or you can also select based on the next best uh, 20 words. And one of the advantages is that it's no longer deterministic. And then you, you can also tune the temperature. So how many how many words you take, you take into account afterwards. So this, you also have to tune this up because it can end up producing text that is, it doesn't make any sense in the sense that it's not repetitive, but it, it, it's not the text you want. So this is some, um, I will read this sentence because it doesn't make any sense to me. It was like one dish and you are on your face food with, you know. So we don't want sequences. We don't want protein sequences that look like that. So the way to, for me, because I don't speak protein, the way to, to check whether it's generating the correct sequences, I thought it would be to compare uh, propensities of the sequences, so the sequences that ProGPT2 generates versus natural ones. So I took a uh, 10 million or no, I took a million sequence sequences from Uniref, and then I look at the propensities and I plot the the propensities of the amino acids, and then this is a this is the same. So it's always like leucine is very common, alanine you know, aliphatic residues. And this is the same plot, but a different representation. So um, the aliphatic ones are the most common 
and then we have color ones and so on. Also, Uniref has some extra residues. So we have also X, B, U, and Z, um, but they are very minor. Uh, so in total, we have like 25 amino acids that can appear in Uniref 50 and ProGPT2 by analogy also samples them. So I decided to start generating from ProGPT2 and then compare the propensities that I get from this from the generation versus uh, the ones that I expect from natural sequences. So I did that like I'm showing them, but I did like millions of plots. And in the end, we observed that greedy and beam search doesn't work very well because it produces so greedy produced mostly alanines and beam search, I don't know, was producing tyrosines and so on until I got to random sampling. And I end up with this um, settings which produce in the end more or less good propensities. So I took these settings and then uh, this is the one that these are the ones that I'm always using, although maybe they're out there in the space of in the multidimensional space of all the possible parameters, a, a more optimal setting out there, but this one satisfied my requirements. So now we can generate lots of sequences. It generates sequences in seconds, millions. So I decided to see how well these sequences compared to natural sequences in several properties, not only like in, in propensities. Sorry. Yeah, so for that, I um, crafted two data sets. I sampled 10,000 sequences from ProGPT2 and then 10,000 sequences from Uniref. They more or less have the same lengths. Uh, I did that on purpose so that they have around 150 amino acids. You can tune the length that ProGPT2 generates. And uh, this is the, the minimum and maximum amino acid length that it has, um, the, sequence, the sequences have. And then I uh, compare several things. We look at um, the content of proteins that are ordered and the percentage of, uh, of uh, uh, domains or sequences that are predicted to be globular with UPRED. And we obtain similar numbers for everything, so order and global, globular content. We also, with Cypre3, we look at the content of being alpha helical, beta sheet, or coil coil, and, and we obtain, sorry, coil, not coil coil, and we uh, also observe similar numbers. Uh, so from the type of sequences that we were generating, we were happy. So then we uh, look at how well, how distant these sequences are to the natural data sets. Um, I wanted to see whether, first of all, um, because it's a common problem with uh, natural with language models that they they don't really learn to generalize over the input, but rather they memorize, so they repeat chunks. So I wanted to see whether I will find exactly same chunks. So I checked that it doesn't happen. in the natural data set I compared I, I searched for them uh, for the sequence that has the highest identity so the, the one with the the most the most homologous sequence in natural data sets and then I plot a point for each of them and then I observed that the natural data set as expected had many sequences in common with the uh, with Uniclus 30 and ProGPT2 as well but in in a lesser extent so it doesn't have a it finds sequences around 48% um, identity to the natural data sets. And then I created a random data set. And uh, this data set mostly produces sequences that are below the cutoff curve, which is the HSPP curve, HSSP curve. And most of the sequences are below the threshold. So it mostly produces sequences that cannot, uh, that are not homologous to the natural um, sequences that we have in the protein space today. And then I wanted to compare it to uh, how, so I wanted to see how the sequences are in the protein space. And to do this, I will very briefly mention that in the past, I had studied how to represent the protein space uh, in terms of how, where the structures, how we can represent where the structures are. 
And for that, uh, we created the fossil database. So we had taken all the proteins that we have in scope and first perform um, sequence alignment to find sequences, so chunks of proteins that are homologous. And then these alignments, we superimpose them. And then in the end, we end up with a database of chunks of proteins that are so, um, in short, sequences that are repeated through the protein space so that evolution has reused them to create new proteins. And then I represented this into a protein space. This was in the past. So we see that for every point represents a protein and then we link to proteins whenever they have a fragment in common. So we end up with a vision of the universe, the protein universe that shows that the universe is connected, that there are very connected regions, but also very island-like regions. And I wanted to see how ProGPT2 feels or where do the new sequence are. So I took the 10,000 sequences and compared them to SCOP. And it's a new coloring method, but mostly I saw that uh, ProGPT2 tends to expand, expand the islands that we already have. Uh, I had a look at some, well, I, I performed the alpha fold uh, prediction for all of them. And mostly they tend to span um, uh, faults that we already know. Although in very rare occasions, we also explore new faults. So in here, I'm showing six proteins, some examples from the different class, classes that we have in structural databases. So for example, from the all alpha, we have this uh, repeat protein. Then we also, I also observed a thin barrel and a multi-domain protein. This is an all beta protein, which are remarkably uh, challenging to design. We had also a new fold, which is an alpha slash beta. And then we also, for example, I'm showing an, a membrane protein. In all these cases, I picked these six to exemplify different regions of the protein space. But I think what is this very important to show is that usually the protein design process in particular for de novo proteins ends up generating uh, proteins that are very idealized and have very short loops uh, and like small cavities. And this is a problem for the next step we, because we want proteins that are stable, yes, but we also want proteins that are functional. And then function usually happens in cavities and, and it, it requires flexible loops for, to allocate ligands and other proteins. So the proteins that ProGPT2 is generating are natural-like, although they are very far away in the protein space or like in the sequence space from natural proteins. So this means that we already end up with ProGPT2 and end up creating scaffolds that are possibly functional, but also they have a structure that could allocate uh, binding partners. And this is extremely important for protein design. I had a look at how well it uh, ProGPT2 is keeping uh, important residues, and I only look at two instances. I will uh, admit that I, I really want to have a further look into how well it's conserving uh, hotspots. And for the two cases that I picked, it conserved almost all of the interactions. So it generated uh, sequences that when the alpha fold prediction was superimposed to the closest. Uh, a structure that we have in natural sequences, then I observed that the major, so the, the interacting residues that pull by the possible ligand were still there. But this is, as I said, some work that I would like to explore in, in the next months. And yeah, I would like to say the model is publicly available, so you can take it and download it, give me feedback, <laughs> wherever you want. And also uh, you can start generating sequences directly from it, but you could also take it and take a data set of your choice of sequences that you are working with and fine tune it. So it will only start generating sequences from that type. Um, I think there are many things that we can still do. And some people are working on in this direction too. So what I did is this part, I took Uniref, and then I train a transformer for GPT-2 to generate new sequences, which I will argue that they are more like family extensions rather than the novel design. Uh, but we can also take pro GPT-2. I haven't done this yet, but uh, I hope some of you do uh, take pro GPT-2 and then fine tune it on your user-defined sequence data sets to extend families of 
um, protein families beyond what nat nature currently has today. We could also take the last layer and use the vector as a downstream task. I haven't done this either yet, but this could potentially work. I would like to see how it compares to other autoencoding transformers like ESCM, although I predict that autoencoding transformers should work better. Also, this is an area of research that I would, like, would love to see more work. Uh, so we don't really yet understand what the transformer is seeing when it generates sequences or when it encodes sequences. So what is the attention looking at in the case of amino acids? So we, there is some work, there's, there's, been, there's been some work for natural language. So for example, in here, they were able to see that in this sentence, the monkey ate the banana because it was hungry. Now for us, it's obvious that it means or refers to the monkey, but for a machine, it's pretty complicated to know whether it refers to the banana or the monkey. So by training transformers, they were able to visualize the heads and the attention is paying. So the attention is looking to monkey and banana and also itself. So this is very powerful. We could also have a look at where the transformer looks when it generates new sequences or when it encodes sequences like in here and perhaps understand rules for particular faults or uh, came up with new ways for rational protein design. I would also like to mention before I sum up that uh, models are getting larger and larger. And this is an issue first because most research groups don't have access to uh, a thousand GPUs or uh, three TPU pods. And if we see, I collected the size of the transformers since the first transformer, and this is a logarithmic scale. So they've been increasing incredibly. And uh, possibly for the protein research uh, field, we can come up with uh, smarter ways of training transformers, as I mentioned at the beginning, perhaps with multiple sequence alignments, because um, uh, in the end, it's becoming a commodity. So I'm, I'm sure no research group out there can train a switch on or maybe switch, but not the Buddha to analogous to proteins because it will take years. Also, this has an environmental impact. So maybe we together can come up with smarter training strategies. And uh, before I let you ask questions or discuss, I would like to say that yeah, as I said, that training these models has become a commodity. ProDBT2 is generating unseen regions of the protein space that share properties of natural sequences. These proteins are more importantly non-idealized and they have long loops and cavities and they aren't a product of memorization and they are distant from natural sequences. And the model is publicly available. It doesn't need further training. You can take it and you can use it for all the um, things that I mentioned in here. If you do, please let me know. I would love to see how it works. And yeah, I believe that we have a lot of work to do as a community for explainability. So we are training lots of models, but still we don't really, we haven't opened yet the black box. And the inclusion of labels during training will, in my opinion, be a revolution in protein design. Uh, ProGene, the other transformer that generates sequences goes in this direction. And I think in this direction, we are going to see a lot of amazing work in the next years. Uh, yeah, and I would like to thank my previous group um, I, in Germany. So uh, Birte, my supervisor, and, and Stefan, who also worked uh, here uh, in this work, in this project with me, and then um, my current uh, institution for funding. So yeah, thank you very much. Please let me know if you have any questions and thanks for listening. All right. Thanks, Nolia. So there's some questions in the chat. Um, I will call on people and try to unmute you. So Jace, I'm going to try to unmute you so you can ask your question. Hello, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, that's that's fantastic. Um, my question is how the biophysical properties of your design proteins compare to like Rosetta design proteins, which I think are often really stable. Uh, and it seems like your model should be able to capture more mesophilic properties or 
you know, intermediate stability. And I also wonder if there's a analogy between dialects of languages and the biophysical environment that a protein lives in, in terms of its pH or salt or temperature. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So for the first question, we are still on with ongoing experimental characterization. So I cannot answer how well in terms of stability they work yet, but I hope to know soon. And uh, regarding the second question, I hadn't thought about that, and I think that's a pretty cool point. Yeah, I haven't thought about what is the possible analogy of the cell environment for language. Maybe, maybe you have some ideas, like pH or so all the biophysical properties. I will think about it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jace. Uh, Tony Giorgino. Yes. So uh, thank you for the, uh, it's your great work for presenting this great work. I was wondering if uh, you see many multi-domain proteins generated, uh, either uh, with repeated domains or uh, with different ones. Thank yes, it, it can generate very long sequences and multi-domain proteins because universal the input data set has lots of very long sequences. So it mimics that. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Parkill. I wanted to know if you uh, thought about experimenting with whether residues are in contact with the ligands for those where there's a ligand structure available. Yeah, that's something I wanted to do now. Um, I, I want to I want to have a look at how well it will recapitulate hotspots for ligand binding. I've only looked at like two, three examples. Um, yeah, that's in the list. I think that's very important. And, interesting part because it will seem that it understands what uh, specific residues are important for binding and keeps them or whether it's just keeping them. So whether it retains that information and produces sequences that keep those residues in particular. Yeah. Well, Alex, Lou. Um, yes, great talk. Um, so my question is more of a conceptual question. Um, how well do you think that the GP3 autoaggressive um, training objective matches proteins? Like, for example, I can see it really working well for natural language because typically you wouldn't, for example, reference a noun before you actually introduce the noun. Language tends, to, language tends to proceed in a very linear fashion. But in contrast, at least in what I'm imagining for domains, for, 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 um, for proteins, is that where you may have like a um, sequence that um, interacts with or connects with a different part of the sequence that occurs much later down in the sequence, but then you don't really see it um, in like um, the component that you give to a model um, for joining them. And so I'm guess, I guess I'm kind of curious about that conceptual difference. Do you think there are any adaptations to these other regressive um, um, objectives to the way that we train language models to better um, learn the grammar of proteins that makes sense then? No, I haven't thought about that. Like, honestly, you're giving me all very good ideas. I mean, maybe we can talk later. Mm -hmm. I would love to, to know more about this. Cool. Sylvia Kiryakov. Oh, yeah, thank you for the great talk. It was, it was, uh, it was really uh, awesome to hear about your work. So during the prediction, uh, like during validating the predicted proteins, um, you you showed uh, data that these proteins are not unstructured, rather they have alpha helices, beta sheets. So how did you determine these structures? Did you use alpha fold and all the design sequences or, or did you use some other algorithm? Um, yeah, first at the sequence level, we used uh, UPRED for predicting disorder and then CYPRED to predict um, uh, so the secondary structure annotation for every residue. So the content of alpha helical and beta sheet and uh, coil, and then alpha fold for each of the 10,000 sequences in the data set. Yeah, so those were the three methods. Well, we have Professor Marco Gaetano Lovicato. Uh, he might not be able to unmute, in which case uh, he asks, how many sequences minimum do you need to train? Pardon, how many sequences in the input did I train? Is this a, is this a question? 
at minimum would you need to train a model like this? That I don't know. Um, um, I don't know. I, I guess you will need something in the order of, but this is like my wild guess, 20 million, <laughs> but maybe. So I, I've been exploring with models of a fewer parameters, but I haven't explored with less, um, or with uh, smaller data sets. So I don't know. Maybe it works with SwissProd as well, but I, I'm not sure. Okay, next is Canon and Yeah, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, so yeah, my question is related to some of the other questions that are already on chat. That is, could you comment on the resources needed to train this on families, individual families? You mentioned that as a potential direction. Uh, say, you know, a family of size, you know, half a million sequences. Um, you know, could you comment on the resources? Um, so fine tune, usually if you have a GPU, it takes some hours. Um, I just fine tune for like three thousand sequences or like like I tried once and and that was like one hour. So for a family where you have a half a million, I'm not sure, but if you have a GPU, you can do it in a day or less. Maybe some people have more experience than I do, but I, for fine tuning, that should be pretty fast. Okay. If it converges. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Amar Tanazumi. Yes, so I want to ask about uh, how can how the functions of this protein can be explored. Like, I mean, yeah. the, they have been designed, so how how can you of course, they can be characterized by the structure, but still, I, I, I guess how, my only guess at the moment. How... Sorry, yeah, I, I like up to a couple of months ago, I didn't know how to, but I guess something like protein fair seems to be working very well. So that will be my to go. All right, thank you. Algorithm. It also the web server they just released seems to be very nice, like it. Outputs where the model is looking at. Yeah, protein fur. That's the only one I. Maybe someone in the audience has a better idea. Yeah, I'm trying to make sure I haven't missed anyone. Uh, Chris Thorpe. Chris asks, have you tried training models in specific families of proteins? If I can retrain, fine tune. If you once. Yeah, have you tried training from scratch or fine tuning in specific families of proteins? I haven't, but I know people who do that. Um, but I don't know how well. Yeah, I was, I was thinking in particular about things like um, antibodies and things where there's so scattered in between the, the different members of the, the family. Um, for types like that, I, I think it should, I haven't tried antibodies, but I think it should work well if you have many sequences that are folding into the same fold. So yeah, I will give it a try. I think that should work pretty well. Problem is if you have like, I don't know, a hundred sequences, something like that, like a very few sequences in the data set then I'm not sure if it will find you very well. No. Yeah, someone says, Sean, just share protein for. Yes, thanks, Sean. Uh, Simon Chu, let's find you, Simon Chu. Multimeric, yeah. Um, sorry, <laughs> possibly, possibly Simon wants to ask. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, um, yeah, so as I said, uh, is there any possibility to, to fine tune or implement it for multimeric sequences? Yes, the only requirement is that you uh, separate, um, that, um, that you create a FASTA file where you remove the FASTA headers and then you put your multimer as a single sequence. 
and then you fine tune that. Does this make sense? So just put the sequence, one monomer after the other within the same tag, and it will generate. It will learn from that. So no, when you you have everything in one fast so far, right? You just put um, yeah. Uh, and of sequences in between. Does the attention break across sequences or does it, uh, do you break the attention across sequences or no? Yes, so I created up, well, my block size was uh, 512. Okay, but do you- So uh, some sequences would be- But do you make broken. sure that like, if I have two short sequences within the sequence in between, did they, during training, can they like see before the end of sequence or no? Um, no, I, so I took the data set and I split into chunks of 512 uh -huh. and whatever comes in, comes in. Okay. Do you, do you think you would do better if you always Maybe. started with the beginning of the sequence? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Uh, Amy Wong. Hi, thanks for the really nice talk. Um, I have two questions. The first is since you're training on Uniref input sequences, are most of your output proteins well folded in alpha fold two? Um, and the second question I have is, do you think you could predict the functional behavior of your design proteins based on the chimeras present? For alpha fold, no. I, so, I mean, I, I, so ProGPT2 generates sequences which follow the, the same patterns of order and disorder of natural ones. So I also saw a lot of disorder, like 12% of proteins are disorder, and then those are in alpha fold, just like random bubbles of coil coil. Um, so yeah, um, I, I did not every sequence that it generates is globular. So one of the questions that I had crossed my, my mind is whether I should have trained it instead only on globular proteins or proteins that are well known to fold. But I wanted also to like explore the current protein space. So also to see what it, the protein space looks like. So to generate the same as we have, if that makes sense. So yeah, like 12% of them are these are there. And uh, regarding the function, I have no idea. The, my best guess is uh, using something like protein fair, which has seemed to work very well. It's um, the, someone just put the link a little bit up in the chat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're at five. Do you have more time going or should we stop here? Me? I do, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Yakub Bartal, I don't know this is your last name, sorry. I think, uh, thanks for a great talk. I was just wondering if you have a way of looking at if there are any differences in which proteins are modeled better or worse. Like if you see any differences in performance between bacterial proteins or homologous to bacterial proteins uh, or viral ones or eukaryotic ones, humans, uh, stuff like that. I have also wondered that, but I don't have a way of knowing whether the sequence that is generating comes from any of the kingdoms because so it could also be that it just has learned a global representation of proteins and it just generates sequences that sample from that so yeah i don't know how exactly it could do that you could look at the test perplexity and different sequences during test set right you should know in the test set where everything came from so like, but like at the input level, but then when I, once ProGPT2 generates sequences. Oh, no, you can't do it for generation, but you can do it for on the training loss or on the test loss. So like, how will you do it? You will take, uh, I don't know exactly you know, how would you. <laughs> you get the log likelihood of a, you take like ah, sequences ah. from your kingdom, you get the log likelihoods per amino acid. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I could do that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Actually, I could do that for many other tasks, right? Yeah. Just rank them by, yeah. Yeah, that's, you could also do that for like um, 
mutation effect prediction and things like that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good uh, idea. Pascal Sturmfels. Thanks. Um, hi, yeah, thanks for the talk. I, um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about, so you talked, uh, one of the things you mentioned is that you byte pair encode all, you use byte pair encoding to tokenize all the protein sequences before you train, which seems, I was just interested in that detail because it seems pretty unusual in the sort of protein mm -hmm. world to do this. Like a lot of ESM and the prod part work and like even the Rosetta or like alpha fold work is all on a per amino acid basis. Yeah. Can you just talk a little bit about a so why like why you were inspired to use the bioprotein algorithm and, and how you think it changes the problem of protein sequence generation? Like, did you did you think about the kinds of tokens that were going into the model? Do you notice any similarities between them? Do you think about so sort of, so these types of things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So actually, with a student, we have had a look at how different tokenizers, or we wanted to bench, benchmark them. The problem I see is that we then need to so. We implemented several of them, including, I don't know, Protubec and protein embeddings and so on. Uh, but once we had them implemented, we always need to change the architecture or let it train and accommodate for, for the protein embedding that we just generated. So I don't have an idea of the benchmark. We, uh, we were exploring this idea and we wanted to see if any of them performs particularly better. In the end, I choose BPE because UPT2 uses BPE, but this has, this, has, this was months of thinking what could work better. I have no idea whether uh, the one hot encoded, so whether amino acids alone will maybe outperform, but I will need to retrain from scratch. That's the problem, but because it's the first layer, then I need to uh, retrain the whole architecture unless someone comes up with a better idea, because this is something that I would really like to do, to benchmark all the embedding methods out there, which are many. This is also for proteins that were specific ones created. So this is fast text, PP, one hot encodings, word to back, and so on. But I'm afraid I will need to retrain always the architecture, right? Well, probably the last question from Sean Johnson. Hey, yeah, I was just wondering if you could comment on whether you think it would be possible to train the model to make like uh, design complexes, like proteins that interact with each other. Like maybe if you prompt it with one sequence and then have it complete by making a, a binder. Like what kind of a data set would you need to train it with to get it to design binders? Um, well, it depends. So it, is the binder another protein? So if that's the case, maybe in a zero shot fashion, could you just put the beginning of your partner, like the, one of the partners and it will generate the other if that's the order in which it happens? I don't know exactly what type of binders or, or, you yeah, have like in mind. Protein my... binders, like proteins that, that bind to your... Uh query sequence. OK, so it, because it generates from in terminus to C terminus, if your binders happen to be in the end terminus, then let it complete or create a data set. I don't know exactly how you could do that because, so if you create a data set where you have one sequence and then another after that the other, how artificial is that? I don't know, is, are your binders, so for example, would you always have them, one of them in the N terminus and the other in the C terminus? Uh, are, are two separate domains? Yeah, I think you'd have to use like some kind of a control token, right, to separate them. Yeah, but the model wouldn't understand the token unless, well, well you could fine tune it with it. I've, honestly, I have no idea. I guess there, there's a way um, because some people have been using GPT-3 to, to also fill blanks of text. So there, there are several ways to fine tune it, but I don't know. Um, if they, if your binders go from N terminus to C terminus, as I said, then you could always input the beginning of a sequence to the model and it will complete it. Okay, right, I see. But if it's in the so, other direction, then yeah, right. I don't know if this helps. <laughs> yeah, no, that, 
That's helpful. Thanks. Well, well, thank you, Noelia, again. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me today.